And we're going to be starting, as I said, a a new series on the unmerited grace of God. Now, I know that's redundant. Don't come after me for the English on this, that unmerited and grace are redundant because grace, by definition, is what? Unmerited. (laughs) Unmerited favor. But I wanted to highlight, I really did want to say that twice because that's what this study is really going to be all about. Us, who we are, what we have done, and compare that to the infinite, amazing grace of God. And no matter what we do, we could never earn it. We can never um, deserve it in any way. Uh, But it is a grace that is given to us by God. And it is an amazing grace. And I just wanted to start with this kind of little question is, do you want what you deserve? How many have ever seen commercials that say, you can get the benefits you deserve? You can live in the luxury you what? Deserve. You can have what you what? Deserve. I hate that word. (laughs) Whenever a commercial tells me that I deserve something, I know they're about to cheat me. (laughs) They don't know what I deserve. And if you sit there in life saying, I deserve this or I deserve that, you're going to be a very miserable person because you will never have everything you think you deserve. Now, here's some good news. God will not give you what you deserve. (laughs) Sometimes there's a good side of that, isn't there? Because what do we deserve? I want to start this study on grace by just reminding us exactly how bad we are. I'm not so bad. No, you are. (laughs) Uh, Anybody at home, anybody here, anybody living, we are what? We're we're bad. How bad are we? Let's go to Romans chapter 3. I know, oh, this is that Paul again. He's always running us down. He's always telling us that, that other thing. This is New Testament, New Testament idea. Old Testament, we weren't so bad. Well, I want to remind you, he's taking this from the Old Testament. <laughs> so, this, has been, this has been the case for a very long time. Romans chapter 3, we're going to start verse 9. What then, are we better than they? So, and this is what we always come down to, right? This Are the Jews better than the Gentiles, right? And, you know, that's the argument this time. But how many times in your life will somebody say, you're better than them, right? Or we even think to ourselves, I am better than I deserve, there's that word again, I deserve more than they do, right? I deserve things better than they, are, they have. I deserve this, I deserve that. And that's the question. Are we better than they? No, in no wise. Nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody deserves more than anybody else. That's not the way it works, right? For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. All sin. And it is written, there is none righteous, let's say it again, no, not one. If you think you are good enough and you deserve the love of God, you deserve the forgiveness of God, you deserve the presence of God, what's the answer? No, no, nobody. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. It's not our desire. We seek gods. <laughs> we seek somebody who can solve our problem. Maybe we'll seek a genie who will come out and solve our problems, and give us everything we need, and heal us. And do. We seek all kinds of things. How many people sought Jesus when he was alive? Oh, thousands and thousands and thousands. How many actually sought God their Savior? <laughs> Very few. There's none actually seeks the one true God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all become unprofitable. There is none that does good. Let's say it again. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And by the way, what does Jesus remind us? Where does all that garbage coming out of our mouth come from? our heart, from inside us, right, from our soul. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is not a positive thing. This is who we are. When you compare us to God, or just in reality, this is who we are, isn't it? In fact, how does What does Romans 3.23 say? He finishes this thought with saying, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
God is here. Perfection, holiness. How do we rate? How do we stack up? Tell me when to stop. Keep going. Should I go down to the basement? <laughs> we, we fall so short. And, and we, I know we sit there and say, we, uh, but, but look, Hitler. Hitler, right? Come on. <laughs> Stalin, these, these great, this, this mass murder. I'm better than that. You know how God sees it? Hitler, maybe you. Okay? <laughs> Comparatively speaking, are we that much even better than they? Or are we more deserving than they? No, we all deserve, in fact, what? What is Romans 6.23? The wages of sin is death. Eternal death. What we earn, what we deserve for our sin is eternal condemnation, eternal separation of God, eternity in the lake of fire, eternity of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is what we deserve. So I want a big hand up from everybody out there that says, I want everything I deserve. <laughs> Do we? By the grace of God, we don't receive what we deserve. In fact, what does it say in chapter 1 of Romans chapter 18? Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who hold the truth in what? Unright. We've turned the truth into a lie, and lies come out of our lips, and we live a lie, and we deserve the wrath of God. How scary is the wrath of God? How many like to think about the love of God? Ah, oh, so sweet, so nice. How many like to think of the forgiveness of God? That's wonderful. Huh? The provision of God, the protection of God. These are wonderful, wonderful things. How many like to think about the wrath of God? Do you realize this world has never actually seen the full wrath of God? What about the flood? No. <laughs> that was not the full wrath of God. The Revelation tells us over and over again that when he pours out his wrath, it will be like nothing we've ever seen before. And even then, he will hold back. <laughs> he will not pour out his full wrath upon mankind because the wrath of God is complete, isn't it? Giving everybody exactly what they deserve. deserve. Why? What's the big deal? Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed them. We know there is a God. We know who he is. We know his love. We know his grace. We know how much, how great he is. But instead, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without what? Excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves wise, they became what? Fools, and would worship anything else. Themselves, other people, things around there, things created, even bugs. How many, can you even imagine worshiping a bug? <laughs> we will worship anything except who? The one true God who created us and loved us. That's who we are. So do we want what we deserve? No, given who we are and the punishment, the wrath of God, which is rightfully, justly given to us, what do we need? If anybody ever asked you that, anybody ever said, what do you need? What, what do you need? What, what are some of the answers you usually give? Right now, I'm hungry, right? I need a sandwich, right? <laughs> I need something to eat. I need some pizza. I need some. How many have ever said I'm, I, I need something to drink, right? I need, I, I'm thirsty. I'm parched. I, I, I need something. I need love, right? I mean, how many need love? How many, how many need a hug? I'm not going to give you one. but <laughs> Later. I'll give you one later. <laughs> we, we say we need so much. I was thinking about this this week. You realize the only thing we really need is grace. 
When you think about it, what if I got all the food I needed? If I didn't have grace, where would I end up? What if I had a really nice house and a car that worked all the time? That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Right, Raj? <laughs> but if I didn't have grace, where would I end up? If I had everything, if I had love, if I had money, if I had all these things I think I need, I got to have this, I got to have that. If I didn't have the grace of God, where would it get me? If I gained the whole world <laughs> and lost my soul, what good is it to me? May have had a nice life here, but where do I end up without the grace of God? Lost forever, getting exactly what I deserve. So is grace important, folks? Grace is fundamental to what we need, and we need to thank God every day. You notice it in there? One of the big sins of mankind is we would not acknowledge God, and we were also not thankful. We should be thankful every day for the grace of God. And this grace goes back to the beginning. By the way, who knows what the first day of today is? What today, today is the first day of what? Fall. fall. So let's go talk about the fall. How's that sound? <laughs> you like that? Like Not like that? Okay, all right. Let's go to it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. And first, let's think about how great God is, right? First of all, is he powerful? Yeah, yeah. Over the first six days of creation, what, what did he manage to create? <laughs> it's, it's, it's astounding, isn't it? Yeah, first day is pretty, pretty just light, time, concept of day and night, started all that, but then he started really rolling, right? I mean, it was just one thing after another after another, and all the planets and all the stars, you know how many stars there are out there? Just the order and all the things and creating it so it all works together, it's amazing. And then on the sixth day, he created, at the end of it all, us, right? In fact, look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. By the way, why plural? Because it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, always working together as one, one God, three persons. If you ever want to just have a discussion on how all that works, let me know, because I'm not really 100% sure. <laughs> I know what it says, I know what the reality is, but it's a tough concept for our little brains, but... Let us make man in our image. You realize how incredible that is? He didn't just create us. He didn't make, create us just like one of the animals. One of the animals that is here today and gone tomorrow. And again, if you want to think otherwise, fine. But, <laughs> but yeah, animals have no soul. They're here. They, they do their thing and then they're gone. But man was created in whose image? In his image, his characteristics, his, his love, his humor, his <laughs> everything else about him. We were made in his image. In fact, he took together the dirt and then he breathed into us life and gave us a soul. We have a part of him inside of each of us. We have that eternal part of a soul, that eternal part of him that is in us. Are we different than the rest of his creation? In fact, he said he made all of those things for who? For us. It's an amazing thing. He wanted somebody he could have a relationship with, somebody he could love, somebody he could talk to. So he wanted that relationship with us that's different than any other part of his creation. He created us in his image. That is a blessing of God, isn't it? Again, not just a created thing. We are an amazing created thing in his image, right? And not only that, let's keep going. Let's go to verse 28. And God blessed them. Adam and Eve blessed them, and God gave unto them, said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, for food. And every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air, to everything that creeps upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, 
and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was what? Very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So not only did he create us, but then he put us into his creation and provided for all of our needs, didn't he? He gave us, did he give us what we needed to eat? In fact, he even created a special little garden, right? A garden where we would have everything we need at all times, and we would even have a relationship with him, right? He would come to us, and he would talk with us, and he would be with us, and us with him. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? In fact, all of it was ours. We were to have dominion over all of it, right? But we can destroy it if we want to. No, don't do that. <laughs> it's God's creation, <laughs> right? Treat it, treat it as it is, with thankfulness, right? So God created us, and then he blessed us, and he also instructed us. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And why is this a blessing? How many, I'm always amazed at how many religions created by man have just a bunch of mysteries. <laughs> it's like, oh, we can't know that. We can't know that. We can't know that. Oh, you got to go along. you got to figure things out along the way. And we used to always do this. Uh, we always had fun with the kids sometimes. We would, we would play a game, but we wouldn't tell them any of the rules. And as they go along, we say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're dead. <laughs> you went the wrong way. You should have gone right, not left. You should know that by now. It's like, how do we know that? I mean, there aren't any rules. Is that what God did to us? Did he like plop us down in the garden and say, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'll tell you one thing. There's a tree. <laughs> There's a tree. If you eat from that one, you're going to die. <laughs> Good luck. Is that what he did? In fact, does he do that to us today? He just like put us in the earth and say, hey, I woke you up this morning. Good luck. I haven't given you any instructions on how to live, how to do the right thing, what's right or what's wrong. I'll punish you to do the wrong thing. Good luck doing the right thing. Is that what he does? Or does God instruct us? Does he give us knowledge of understanding of what's right and what's wrong? And does he help us along the way and give us the Holy Spirit to remind us? He does all that thing. He instructed us. Did he instruct them? Absolutely. How many rules were there in the garden? One. That should be easy, right? <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, except. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt eat not eat of it, for in that day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now we learn when the serpent came and talked to Eve, that God pointed out where it was and put it in the very center of the garden so everybody would know that that's the one tree you do not eat, right? Did he instruct them? Did he give them the reason why not to eat? See, sometimes people feel that way. Oh, God's always telling me what to do, but he never tells me why. And when I asked, he said, because I'm God. Remember how mom used to do that? Because I said so, because I'm the mom, right? See, God didn't even do that. God's like, well, because it's good for you, and let me show you why. In fact, I'll give you history <laughs> to show you why. <laughs> I will instruct you. I will help you understand. I will make sure you understand so that you can do what is right. Is God good? Has God blessed us? Yes. Not only that, he cared for us. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. He looked down at this very good creation, but he realized that man needed a relationship, right? Needed another human being, another person. God was not enough, which is a sad statement, isn't it? <laughs> Having a relationship with God was not enough. It needed a somebody else. Now, he brought all the animals. Could the animals fill that? So he made him fall asleep, and then he created what? Woman. And then they could multiply, and they would have relationships, and they would have people to live with, and families, and down through history. See, God saw that we had a need, and did he care for us? So look at, look, look at these blessings. God created us in his image. He blessed us with everything we could possibly need. He instructed us on what is right and what is wrong so we make sure we can do the right thing and stay with him forever. And then he cared for us. If we had any need, he fulfilled it. 
Now, what would you do in that situation? <laughs> How many would be happy? How many would be thankful? How many would know that they are loved and know that they will be with God forever? Because he is so great. That should have been the response. Unfortunately, what was mankind's response? Don't, don't pick this on Adam or Eve. You know Adam and Eve basically just wanted to point to somebody else as if it's their fault, right? Don't, don't put this situation on them. This is our fault. When realizing and knowing all of this about how much God loves them and who he is, still mankind says what? Now, I don't want that relationship. I don't trust him. I don't believe God is telling me the whole truth. I don't believe God really has my best interest in mind. I really don't believe that God truly loves me. Why do I say it that way? Because it's exactly what the serpent said to Eve, wasn't it? All right, let's go take a look. Chapter 3, verse 1. I have no idea, by the way, from the time God created and put them in the garden until the serpent came. I don't know how long that was. But that was a wonderful time in history. <laughs> but I'm guessing it didn't last very long because we were involved. And Satan was involved, right? Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle, cunning, than any beast of the field which the Lord hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Hasn't he said you can eat of all of them? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you what? Die. Did, did they know the rules? <laughs> they knew the rules. Did they know the tree? They knew the tree, right? But what does Satan spin this? <clears throat> Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. In other words, what was his first salvo? God is a what? Liar. He's just trying to control you. He's just trying to keep you from something great. God is selfish. God is mean-spirited. God is controlling. Now, why in the world would she believe that? <laughs> silly, silly woman. Let's ask ourselves, why do we believe the lies about God? Why do we believe things about God that are not true? Does God love you? Does God want the best for you? Are his ways right and his will always perfect? Do we believe that? Oh, whispering her ear, nah. <laughs> That's not true. In fact, look, verse 5. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I love the way he says that. He is more subtle. <laughs> Notice what he's saying. By the way, is that true? Is what he's saying true? The answer is yes. It's true. When they eat that fruit, their eyes will be open, and they will know both how to do good and evil, and they will be like God. How's he, he's, how's he uh, putting it out there, though? That's a good thing. <laughs> How many times does Satan come into our life and say, hey, if you do that bad thing, look at this wonderful thing that's going to happen. When actually, what is that thing that's going to happen? Is it good? Is it, it may seem good for a very short period of time, but then comes what? The disaster and the consequences and things like that. He's always trying to couch the consequences as if they're a good thing. And God's always sitting there saying what? No, it is a bad thing. Listen to me. But he got her thinking. Verse 6. And when the woman saw... By the way, anybody wonder why she was even near that tree to begin with? Sometimes we like to kind of steer very close to the sin, don't we? <laughs> we're, we're not bright that way. When saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, according to Satan... She took, of, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened, 
And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons to cover themselves. So what was the response of mankind to all of God's great blessings? I don't trust you. I don't trust that you have my best interest in mind. Therefore, I will do what I think is best. Based on what? What did she base this on? The words of a serpent and her own eyes. What I perceive to be good, what I perceive to be right, I will do the thing. Do you realize how great this sin was? Can you imagine being God? You created all of this for them. You created it all for them. And some little snake comes along and says a few words, and all of a sudden they are rebelling against you. Then they are doing sin. Then they are realizing right and wrong, and then choosing what? Wrong, right? Sin nature comes in, and all these things, and it's all, and it's all because they didn't just sit there and say, no, God is good. God loves me. And God knows what is best. If they would have just said that, they would have been fine. But instead, they listened, didn't they? How much that, would that hurt? Any parent here knows what that's like. How many took care of your kids? Yeah? <laughs> How many blessed them and gave them everything? And then sometimes in their life, there can come that time, not every time, but sometimes it'll come in their life where they'll just sit and say, I don't believe... You know what is best for me. Does that hurt a little bit? I'm going to listen to my friend at school. He's really smart. <laughs> He's been around. He's like 14. And we'll listen to them. They'll listen to them. They'll go down a way that you know that is not right. It doesn't hurt. It hurts to know where they're going, but also it hurts a little bit that they didn't trust you, doesn't it? And we did not trust the God who created us and gave us everything we needed. How did that have to hurt God? Now, how would you react if you were God? By the way, I'll say this, I'll say it before, I'll say it again. I am so glad that I am not. Because if I were God, y'all wouldn't be either. <laughs> See... We have that knowledge of good and evil, and sometimes we choose the what? The evil, right? God does not, thankfully. Frankly, how would you react to that? How would you react? He did everything for them, gave them everything, and they listened to the stupid snake and did exactly the one thing. You gave them one rule, <laughs> and they broke it because they did not trust you. How would that make you feel? What would you want to do? Come on. What would you want to do? Huh? Beat him. Oh, it's a big gun. Yeah. Start over. <laughs> Let's do a do-over. But what are we studying about? Grace. The unmerited grace of God. He showed them grace. He did not give up on them. In fact, by the way, did he know this was going to happen? Did he create them anyways? Did he plan to send his son to die for them anyways? See, the grace of God, no matter how much we hurt him, and that had to hurt him. That had hurt deep. He still showed them what? Grace. In fact, let's go look at that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 8. So Adam and Eve were there. They now knew evil and good. All these new thoughts and <laughs> ideas started coming into their head. They hid. Right? Now, first of all, if you knew that happened, how many at least would do a little silent treatment? I'm not going to talk to them for a while. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go down and talk to them. But one of the great things about this story is right after that happened, who comes to them? Adam and Eve didn't go to God. In fact, they hid from God, right? They hid away. If it was up to them, they'd never see God again. They knew exactly what they did was wrong. They, they just, get, I want to run away. I just don't, I don't want to forget this ever happened. I don't want to deal with God anymore. I know what I've done is wrong. But God comes to them. Is there grace in that? 
Is God always there for us no matter how far away we get? Always there. In fact, let's look at the, what happened. Chapter 3, verse 8 of Genesis. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. He came down just as he always did. Knowing what they had done, he still came, didn't he? Because God will not ever leave us or what? Forsake us. He will always be there for us, just like the prodigal son, right? Was the father willing to take that son home? Was the father always out there looking and waiting and hoping the son would come home? Not as a servant, but come home as a son? Same with us. He will always be there for us. He will always come to us. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. The Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Now, did he know? How many times does God give us a chance just to stand up and do what's right? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really, but you know, it gives a chance. Verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice. Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now again, did God know this? Yes. He knew it, but he's, again, he's going to give him a chance. You, Parents have done this with kids, too, right? You know exactly what the kid's done. You're just waiting for the kid to do what? Admit it. <laughs> Come to me. Say you're sorry. Acknowledge what you've done. He's given them a chance, and what do they do with that chance? Verse 12. And the man said, the woman whom you gave me. So whose fault is it ultimately? God, if you just wouldn't give me this woman, then we'd all not be in this situation. By the way, is that true? No, no. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now, again, if I'm God, and thankful I am not, I'd be like, okay, she twisted your arm, shoved it down your throat, made you eat it? No. <laughs> we, 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 we'll blame anybody, anything, anytime, won't we? Instead of taking accountability. He did not take accountability. Verse 13. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? So what did you do? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. He, it's not his fault, shouldn't have created those stupid serpents, right? No accountability. That's us, isn't it? Verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And right there we have the very first promise of a Savior. This is the first prophecy regarding the Christ, the Messiah, who would come and crush the head of serpent, the one who would come and set us free from the penalty of sin, the one that would come and give us new life even though we chose death. That's called what? Grace. Grace by his presence, but also grace by his what? Promise. And does God always keep his promises? He promises to make a way. And again, he already had the plan set up that it would be him. It would be God himself who would come to be one of us, to go to a cross and die for us and rise again victorious and give us life over death. Right? Right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And right at the very beginning, even as he is punishing them, he is also giving his what? His promise. That I will make a way. How many ways? One way. Just like there was one rule in the garden, there's one rule now, isn't it? Put your faith in Jesus Christ and you shall live. By his grace. He is already showing his tremendous grace and patience here, isn't he? Well, let's keep going. Because even in his punishment, we will see grace. <coughs> Again, chapter 3, verse 16. Unto woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be thy husband and he shall rule over thee. So the woman, he gives tremendous pain in childbirth. Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> You're familiar with it already, though. 
in case you've forgotten. So where's the grace in that? Will she have children? Is he going to keep going with this experiment known as human beings? <laughs> yes, Adam and Eve will have what? We'll have children, and their children will have children, and their children will have children, and their children's children's children will have children. And yes, they will keep going. The, the human race will continue, won't it? Is there grace in that? They will have the blessing of children and family and all of that, even though we chose to disobey, chose to distrust, chose to turn against God, he will still give us life, won't he? And life eternal will be eligible. Who can get that life eternal? Any of those children, <laughs> right? I will give you life, and he will continue. Even in his punishment, he's saying what? I will still bless you. What about Adam? Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for thou... For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Even in that, all the problems, all the weeds and everything, we were out in the forest, we were hiking around Lake Fairfax yesterday, and somebody was like, why do we have poison ivy? Why do we got all these weeds? Why do we got all this stuff? I said, well, <laughs> Adam's fault. <laughs> no, it's our sin. We live in a fallen world. That's, that's the reason for it, right? It's going to be hard. But what do you notice? In fact, how many times does he say, you will eat? You notice that? How many times? You will eat. It'll be out of the sweat of your brow. It'll be in spite of the thistles and the thorns. It'll be in spite of the weeds and stuff like that. And the ground is cursed, but you still will what? You will still eat. You will still have children, and you still will eat, and mankind will go on, and I will make a way that all mankind might be saved. Is that grace? Tremendous grace, isn't it? One of the weird punishments that people always ask me about is the fact that then God, speaking to him amongst himself, says, what should we do with them? Because they could go eat from the tree of life. And then they would live forever and never die. And they came to the conclusion that they needed a what? We need to cast them out of the garden and put a barrier around it and fiery swords to keep them from ever touching the tree of life. Even in that punishment, was there grace? Yeah. I was, I was wondering about that. I was like, why? Well, you think about it for a minute. If they would have gone and eaten from the tree of life, they would have lived forever. Therefore, they never would have acknowledged that they needed a what? A savior. <laughs> they would have lived apart from God, without his help, without a relationship, but lived forever and ever and ever. Is that, is that living? Again, how many would say, what I need is a longer life. <laughs> I need a healthier body. I need my legs to work. I need legs for Christmas. I need uh, the arthritis, God. I need health. I need to live forever. If you don't have grace and you don't have God, is even living forever any good? No. By the grace of God, he, oh, even in his punishments, is he good to us? Yes, he is. It's what we need to bring us to him, right? So, is God's grace available today? I see a lot of sinners out there. Y'all are, if you're curious. <laughs> uh, all the people at home, too, are. We're all sinners. I know we can get down on Adam and Eve. They were perfect. They had everything. They saw God. They knew all this stuff. Why would they do that? But how many of us know that there's a God? How many of us are blessed by him every day? How many of us still sin? Still listen to the world? Still listen to our own ideas? Still try to decide our will is better than his will. How many of us still hurt God every day? How many are thankful for grace? Is his grace there for us now too? All of his blessings are there, but also because of our sin, his grace is also there. That unmerited grace of God follows us every day of our life, and then we will be what? In the house of the Lord forever, right? His grace is there for us. How many are thankful for that? In fact, one last place to go. Romans chapter 3.
everybody knows Romans 3.23, right? For all of sin comes to the glory of God. We know that one. Do you know what the verses right after it are? Now Spurgeon calls these the most important verses in the Bible. Because as it acknowledges what we are, it talks about the grace of God. We've all sinned. We've all come short. Therefore, we all deserve eternal condemnation. But what? Being justified freely. We are made right freely. Not by our works, not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, but freely he justifies us by his, what? Grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfying sacrifice through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the payment, remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance, the patience of God. How much grace is in those just few words? <laughs> The grace of God, that God, even though we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, says, I will make you right. I will make you, in my eyes, righteous and perfect and holy, so you can enter my presence if you will just believe. If you will just believe that Jesus Christ, my only son, came and died for you, that you might have life. If you just believe that, I will bestow all my grace upon you and give you life and make you my child. And I will never leave you or forsake you, and I will take you home to be with me forever. That is the grace of God, and it's available to who today? Anybody. Just checking. Everybody take a breath. It's available to you. <laughs> you have no breath? Eh. But the grace of God is what? Available to all if we will just come. Acknowledge that we are sinners. Acknowledge we've turned against God. But seek his grace. Say, Lord, please save me. Will he? Yes, he will. And you know what? That was just the start of how bad we are. So let's go a little more next week. All right? How bad can we get? How great can God's grace get? That's what we'll be looking at. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.